Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Thanks for joining us again, listeners. You know, I always appreciate your time and attention. Today, I've got an extra special story for you. We're not going to have tips and advice as much as kind of how to process your feelings around your loved one's diagnosis. So with me today is Steph Jagger. Is it Jagger or Jagger? You got it, Jagger, like Mick Jagger. Okay. I meant to ask that before we hit record, (laughs) and then I realized, oh, fudge. Okay. She is the author of the book, Everything Left to Remember. She decided to take her mom on a nearly two-week national park camping trip when her mom was probably in the, what was it, mid to later stages of Alzheimer's? She was still pretty early, actually. Um, okay. About a year after she was diagnosed, and she had been showing signs for some time, but um, she was she was in the re- relative early stages, I'd say. Okay. Because it's, my mom had Alzheimer's for so long, it's hard to... It's hard to recognize other people's stages sometimes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And everybody's different. So, um, as we were just mentioning, your mom was diagnosed in 2015 and you took this trip in 2016. That's right. That's right. Um, so how did, so you su- suspected that your mom had Alzheimer's like most of us probably, well, we know something's wrong, but we don't necessarily know what it was. Mm-hmm. And your gr- maternal grandmother also had Alzheimer's? Yeah, my maternal grandmother um, had had dementia, a fairly classically presenting old age dementia. Um, she began showing signs of that in her late 80s, um, was living on her own and, and eventually um, passed in her mid 90s and um, kind of overlapped actually um, with a lot of the signs that my mom was showing. And I remember toward the end of my grandmother's life, seeing the two of them together was um, pretty excruciating actually. Um, but yeah, my, my, they, they both presented very differently. Cause you know, this is one person is in their late, late eighties, early nineties. Another person is in their, you know, mid to late sixties and showing different signs. Um, but that, that was a difficult thing for me to grapple with as, as the daughter and granddaughter inside of that lineage at the time. Yeah. Well, as my listeners know, I had a similar issue. So my maternal grandmother had vascular dementia Mm -hmm. and my mom was showing more and more signs of forgetfulness. We had a business, a photography business, and she would take orders from clients with no directions, no due dates, no helpful information. And one day um, I was really good at hovering of helicopter caregiving, Mm -hmm. trying to Mm -hmm. prevent having to call people and say, what was it you told mom? Because she forgot to write it down and kind of just inserting myself into their conversation. I found a, an order with no directions, no due dates, no information. And Mm -hmm. I, I asked her, what are we supposed to do for Steph here? And she's like, I don't know. That's so-and-so's handwriting. I was like, uh, no, it's not. And they're not even similar. She was comparing, she was saying it was the, one of the employees handwriting. And then I told her, you're having more daffy moments. You know, you used to have a couple a week. Now you're having a couple a day. And I'm starting to get really concerned. And before I could suggest anything, she's like, well, I don't want to end up like my mother. And she turned on her heel and stomped off in the other room. And I was like, okay, well, murder is illegal. So I don't know what she thinks I'm supposed to do here. I can relate to the excruciating. Yeah. Yeah. It's not fun. And then. My mom couldn't deal with her mom because she was in very late stage, wheelchair bound, Mm -hmm. didn't speak, Mm -hmm. all of those charming things. And my mom knew that was her future and she couldn't deal with it. So, well, I mean, yeah, it's it's, that caused problems with the family. Yeah. Yeah. And it was just it was not fun. So why did you decide to take your mom on a camping trip? I I get the sense from the book that that was not something you guys normally did as you were growing up. No, it wasn't. I could, I could count the number of times I'd been camping like on one hand and, and most of those times, like other people had taken care of the actual like camping part. (laughs) And, and yet, um, I had spent quite a bit of time in the outdoors and, um, I always had, you know, memories growing up, we were a really athletic family. We just weren't an outdoorsy family. And so 
when I, the, the, the trip, the idea for the trip really, Jennifer was like a, a bolt from the blue. Like it just, it just arrived in my head. Like you're supposed to go to this place. You're supposed to take your mother. And I won't get into the whole backstory, but I, I had already been on about a 10 year journey of really kind of trusting my own intuition and following those calls, you know, really paying attention to those when they showed up. And I thought, well, that's actually good timing because, you know, in the next handful of maybe a year, that that might be the only time I could do something like this with her, um, given that she had been diagnosed about 10 months earlier. So when the idea came to, to go into nature, to go into the national parks and to make it camping and tenting and, you know, all that kind of stuff, it felt really natural to me because, you know, my, my mom was always a person, even though we weren't outdoorsy as a family, she was always a person that really lit up in nature both there was two things that happened she really lit up but also simultaneously became very calm very relaxed and and i wanted to spend time with her in that state um and and i thought this is going to be really my, my dad would never he if i had, if i had asked my dad to go on a trip like that he'd be like no we're staying in hotels i have to have a shower and a shave he's he was not an outdoorsy guy and i just knew my mom would it, the trip would really knock her socks off even if she wasn't going to be able to remember it it was just really important that I wanted to spend as many days as possible with her in that kind of state of relaxed awe you know and so so I phoned them and asked them and it coincided really really well my dad had already planned his own trip um and I think was very very worried about leaving her it was just at the period of time where I think the idea of leaving her for 10 days or two weeks was like, Ooh, I don't think that's the smartest decision with her stage of progression. And so the timing worked out extraordinarily well and provided a, a respite and a break for him, which we all know is really important for the primary caregiver and provided a nice opportunity for my mom and I to gallop into nature together, get our hands dirty. Okay. So I'm just, I'm, I'm remembering the comments in the book. Well, let me back up. Was she confused? Like every morning you kind of had to remind her of where you were and what you were doing. You, you kind of allude, talk about that a little bit in the book. And yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. She was, when I first presented the idea for the trip, she was a little bit confused, not in a confused, like frustrated, confused in like, well, this is, strange like will I like this like I don't I don't remember nature so much like will I enjoy this and I think both my dad and I were like yes you will like we know you well enough to know yes you will and she she's thank goodness you know a really really trusting person and so she really trusted us to be like yes you'll enjoy this and then when we were on the trip itself she would wake up kind of like you know, if, if if someone's been in a really deep sleep and they wake up and they're like, wait, is it Wednesday or is it Friday? You know, this is the kind of way that she would wake up. She'd look, she'd wake up and look around and be like, we'd be inside of a tent, right? <laughs> so she'd, she'd look around and be like, where am I? You know, and it wasn't a panic. It was confusion, but it wasn't panicked or frustrated. It was just like, what is happening here? And so each morning I would get to remind her like, you know, we're in Wyoming, we're on this trip together, you know, and sometimes she would remember that I was her daughter. Sometimes she would think I was her mom or her sister or a really close friend. And very typically she would then ask, where's Brian, which is my dad's name. You know, is Brian with us? Is Brian here? She was very not concerned, just kind of curious as to why he wasn't there. And, you know, on most occasions she would kind of come to like, okay, okay, we're in a tent. And then, you know, turn to me and say, oh, Brian would hate this, you know, in this way of like, I love this, but he would really hate this. So it was, it was, a, it was lovely. And her confusion was never, never showed in that stage. Certainly this changed uh, in her later progression, but really never was showing at that point, you know, frustration or panic or a lot of worry. Which was, my mom seemed yeah. to have a lot of worry and yeah. she didn't seem to have a lot of trust. So maybe that's why when yeah. I read the book, I was just like, yeah, I cannot imagine even thinking about doing this much less actually doing it. Yeah. And, and I'll say, you know, like my grandmother, um, going back to like my experience with her, 
that would have been very tricky. She she didn't have her confusion, especially at the beginning, really presented more as frustration or lack of trust or whoa, I'm not quite sure about that. And so, and and I I I knew that of my mom. I knew that of the way she was presenting at the time. And it felt like, okay, this will be a good fit. It might not be for many, many folks who are going through a similar thing. I think it's just so highly dependent on the stage somebody is at, as well as how the disease is really presenting for them and how it's creating potential shifts in their personality. That makes perfectly good sense. Did you have sort of a bailout plan if it just all went every every which way but correct? I mean, absolutely. In my mind, I kind of thought, you know, we weren't putting backpacks on and walking into the woods and spending two weeks in the wilderness. You know, this was car camping. You know, we had all, we had a cooler with food in the back. We had, you know, we were pretty set up to kind of pull into campgrounds and there's lots of help around. There's cell phone service in most of those campgrounds. I, we also had a car. And so if something wasn't working out, then I could drive, you know, relatively quickly to a, a pretty close town. I selected national parks that had larger towns close by um, so that if we needed to go and stay in a hotel, we could do that. So there was certainly um, options and backup plans um, in my mind. And you know, one of the greatest lessons my mom has given me all through my life, not just through the journey of Alzheimer's and dementia, is is really her ability to be trusting and to surrender, not in a, not in a, um, I'm giving up, but kind of in a, I'm going to let an experience like carry me. And so um, I I did have backup plans, but I, I didn't have to deploy any of them. So that's great. <laughs> you did have a couple of close calls. One when you almost ran out of gas in a yeah. nowhere town yeah. <laughs> so to speak and yeah. did she get concerned when i mean you finally had to admit to her that you guys were maybe in a little bit of a tr- pickle did yeah. she did she pick up on your emotions then like oh, oh crap. i think <laughs> she yeah i think she was picking up that i was i was panicking i was getting a bit agitated and i think she was picking up on it but didn't know why and didn't really know how to communicate Um, why? Um, but she kept kind of referring to the map, like asking me questions about where we were. And I think she knew I was asking questions about where are we and where is the closest gas station and, you know, what is going to happen here? And she was attempting, I think so many, so many women do, and so many mothers do, you know, even with Alzheimer's and dementia present, there was a lot of, I think, emotional labor she was putting in, you know, I was panicked. She could sense it. She could, didn't know why, but was attempting to soothe it by like finding the right route on the map and to be very helpful. And we did not run out of gas, thank goodness, because I I really was thinking, oh my gosh, am I going to have to, like, I can't, leave her in the car. And I also can't make her walk however many miles in the cold. I was very panicked. So thank goodness we found a gas station. Um, with, and with no attendant. <laughs> with no attendant. It was, you know, it, I, in the book, I, I mean, not to give anything away, this won't give much away, but it was, it was a gas pump from, I don't know, 1910. It was just a singular, it was unbelievable that I even found this thing. And I had no clue how to operate it. There was no attendant. There was no person to pay. I had to like walk into multiple stores to be like, can someone like, does this thing still work? Um, and it did, and it was all fine. Um, and then I think the other close call you're referring to is the moose. That's true. I was actually thinking of your mom's insistence on getting a specific beverage. So that's not a close call. That was just another weird experience that you had with her because she's not a huge drinker yeah wasn't. yeah she really was never a big drinker um when we were growing up and at that's in that stage of alzheimer's um you know the couple of years prior and the couple of years after diagnosis she did drink a bit more and i don't I, you know i still don't know entirely what that is whether that's just like okay i can this is going to take the edge off. Like I'm really working hard to like hold this world together mentally and emotionally. And it it just kind of allows me a state of relaxation. Um, And so, yeah, she was really excited about finding Gleva. It's a very, I don't even know. I don't even know if they have it in the United States or if it's a Canadian thing, but it was a very specific drink that she 
Um, it's kind of like a port or a whiskey. And um, we could not find it. I couldn't find it anywhere. And so I ended up um, getting some Baileys for her and she highly enjoyed that experience. And didn't you go through two bottles of that in the week and a half? She went through, we, we, she went through the first bottle very quickly and I was like, okay, we can't, <laughs> no, you know, I didn't replenish the stock. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So since you alluded to it, I guess you, I'll, I'll have you explain what you mean by the, in, the encounter with the moose, which, you know, I live amongst wildlife, deer and other slightly smaller critters. <laughs> But um, your mom had a real affection for this moose. Yeah, I mean, it was a it was a small baby moose. They look very cute, like most um, small mammals. You know, you want to go up and pet, like you want to see if you can pet the baby deer, or even sometimes a baby bear. You think, oh my gosh, that looks cute enough to pet. <laughs> and most folks, even if you don't have a huge awareness of the outdoors, know that if you see a baby animal, very likely the mama is close by. And so she saw this baby moose and was like, you know, moosey moosey. She really wanted to like walk towards it. And I remember my aunt and I both like grabbing the back of her jacket and like pulling her back. And she, she was kind of like, what do you know, a little bit angry? Like, what are you, why are you, do, why are you being so rough with me? And we were like, you do not want to pet that moose. And we slowly kind of walked back. And again, she was um, confused. And at that point, that was a confusion and frustration with us that we were pulling her. And, and lo and behold, you know, mama moose kind of sticks her head out from behind the bushes and we're, you know, slowly backing up. And even later on, she's like, why did you do that? Why were you pulling us away. And, you know, we had to explain that, you know, the mama, and it's so interesting to think about this, you know, explaining to my own mother, you know, mamas can be fierce, you know, when they feel their little ones are, are at risk, you know, they can be really fierce in the wild and thinking, gosh, in how many ways and how many shapes and forms would have, you know, my mother protected me through my own life. Um, and seeing this in nature. So we were not trampled by moose, but uh, we were real close to that little baby. And female moose have, you know, antlers or horns or whatever they're called as well. Just not as big as the males. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. You know, I'm not entirely sure about the difference between um, male and female moose. Um, all I know is that that mother moose was, I don't know that she had a rack of, of antlers, but she was, I mean, this is a colossal animal. I think a lot of people don't, when they think about moose, they kind of think about deer unless, unless they live in places where they see them and, and moose are not deer. They, moose are huge animals. Um, so you, you, you don't really want to come up upon one. Yeah. I, I live in deer territory. Uh -huh. And there's Same. lots of them. And yeah. frequently while you're walking the dogs, you'll encounter them. They have very little fear of humans. They're like, oh, there's those rodents yeah. we allow to live near us. 
Right. And um, back when I had two golden retrievers, was a, so it's a little more management on walking. This one deer looked at my dogs and literally stomped the front two feet on the uh-huh. ground. Like, uh-huh. And uh-huh. my dog was like, not getting close to that thing. Yes. They didn't bark yes. at them. They didn't get close to them. Yes. Exactly. And deer are not, I mean, the one deer, I, the closest I got just because... You know, they sort of blend into the background, and the next thing you know, oh crap, there's one five feet from me. They're probably about six ish feet tall. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, I'm five foot two, so they're yeah, not a lot I've, taller than I've me. I've had a couple of interactions with it, depends on the season. If they're in rutting season, they can be, especially the, the male um, deer, can be, I mean, they're big and they've got antlers, and they're, um, I've had a couple not charge me, but like, char- like kind of charge beside me as if to say, like, we're not coming at you, but you don't you don't come over here. Um, yeah, keep walking away. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're powerful. They can be very powerful animals. Yeah. And yeah, was, gonna... imagine if you could imagine that, imagine a moose is probably two or three times the size. Yeah. I'll, I'll watch the moose from a yeah. distance. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you alluded to mamas being fierce and how your mom protected you. And then of course, with Alzheimer's, the script gets flipped. Mm-hmm. So you were processing a lot of, feelings and emotions and etc during this trip was that part of the plan or did you just want to spend time with mom or you just got this well, idea in your head and you ran with it <laughs> yeah i mean i certainly i certainly got the idea in my head and i ran with it i also knew i wanted to spend time with her um in a particular way you know before that opportunity was was no longer existent for us in, in that way. And, um, and I think I knew if I am going to be present, truly present to be able to absorb, you know, the goodness of her awe and her calmness in nature, all of those things that I really wanted to spend time with, then there would probably be some emotional processing as I go, um, that I'd have to kind of look, lock eyes with things and, and process them as in the moment as possible, because if, you know, it, it, for me, it, it comes down to the difference between conscious grieving, like I'm going to actively choose to look at this and grieve this as best I know how, so that I can remain present with this individual, as opposed to unconscious despair, which is, I don't want to look at those emotions. I don't want to feel those things. That means that I'm going to lose the capacity to be completely present and, and, and probably lose the ability to soak up as much of this opportunity as I can. Now, I don't have judgment over any of those paths because sometimes things are really hard to look at. Um, but I did know that there was going to be some emotional processing as I was traveling with her for sure. Was the book planned after the trip or did that, the idea come to, because this is your second book. Yeah, so it-, it is. It is. Yeah. I had no idea I was going to write it when I went on the trip with her and you know, writing for me outside of outside of publishing, outside of deciding to then take that work public is a really cathartic part of how I process emotions, speaking of what you were saying before. And um, as soon as we were on the plane home, she was in the seat next to me, like in her adult coloring book. And I brought out my phone and, and was kind of started madly typing stuff in my app on my on my notes app in my phone. And I got about, you know, an hour into the plane ride and I had written and written and written. I thought, oh, uh uh-oh, I think this probably is going to be a book. I think I knew that early, but going into the trip, I did not have a plan to, to, for it to be a book. So backing up just a little bit. So you knew, you said you're going into the trip, you were consciously like conscious grieving so that you could remain present with your mom. And I know you hear all the advice, oh, you have to go into their reality or be in their reality. Yeah, it's like, yeah. And it took a long time into my mom's disease for anybody to actually explain that. It might've actually been after she died where I got a good explanation of what that meant. I mean, I, I understood it from dealing with her, but you know, I'm a logical um, I'm half entrepreneur, half artist. So it's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. I'm very good at, um, you know, making a to-do list, getting a timetable, da, 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 you know, getting the things done that I need to get done. So then I can do the other things like, you know, yeah. since we finally have nice weather, you know, take the dog to the dog park. Um, we lost one recently. So she's mm-hmm. an only dog, never has not been an only dog in her eight and a half years. Oh, wow. Well. So you know, it's important to take her to the dog park and socialize. And it's good for me too. So it's like, I keep my eye on the prize. Like 
Yeah. I'm going to get this work done so I can do X. And sitting with my mom and repeatedly answering questions, it's like, I, it was very hard not to question, is this doing anybody any good? Like, if I leave and go to the bathroom and come back, she's not going to remember I was here. So like, yeah, it yeah. was always a challenge to be in her reality and not have my reality just screaming in the background, like you have better things to do than answer this question another 10 yeah. times. So Absolutely. how did you, how did you kind of keep focused on her and the present and, and grappling with, you know, your emotions and all that, all that heavy and good stuff. Yeah. I think there's a multitude of different ways of answering this. And I think the first is probably to give, you know, what I think is, is not easy work, but is a, is a simple way of describing how I deal with emotions. Like when you're like, Oh, you, you process your emotions so you can be present. I think a lot of people are like, what is that? What do you mean? (laughs) Exactly. You know? And so I think there's an easy way that I think about emotions and, and define emotions. And so I think of them as emotions, energy in motion. And so what emotions really are, are sensations in our body, physical sensations in our body that we name as a particular emotion, right? Now, everybody feels emotions in a little bit of a different way because we all live in different bodies, But you can typically call, let's say anger is maybe a very fast moving emotion that feels quite fiery in the body or very quick in the body and usually centers from like somewhere in our stomach and comes up, you know, that kind of um, thing. Um, So, and other emotions, sadness might include like a little, there might be a curling in of the body. There might be a little bit of collapse. There might be a slower energy or a kind of a sludgier energy kind of dependent. That's just two examples. So whenever I think of processing emotions, I think of energy in motion and all energy wants to do is move from one form to another form. Typically what we do is we feel a sensation in our body and we go, whoa, that's uncomfortable. I don't like that. And so we either do, we do one of two things. We either push it down and be like, you have to stay where you are and I'm not going to feel you. Or we move it up into our head and say, head, you're so smart and logical. Could you just like be rational and tell us what to do with this? But that's not the job of our head. The job of our head, as you said before, is like spreadsheets and taxes. (laughs) So what I really like to do when I am thinking about energy and motion in my body is it wants to just move from one form to another. And how do I let it pass? And there's two things that I do to let it move from one form to another. I pick a sound and a movement that match it. That's interesting. Now, that is um, sometimes feels juvenile because we've been told to be keep our bodies together and keep our voices in control when we ever since we were like probably about six or seven. But it really works for me. So if I'm feeling sad, I might do something like, oh, you know, and tip my head forward and just be like, oh, and it helps. It lifts it. It moves it. You know, I won't do anger because anger can be really loud on a podcast, but, um, you know, there's different, if, if I feel joyous, if I feel joyful about something, I might go up ah! and raise my arms and be really joyous about it. So that's just one tip I'll give for people who are looking for ways to actively process emotion in the moment. The second thing for me is um, how do I stay, you know, present with her in her experience, as you were saying, and asking the same question, you know, is she asking the same question over and over again? This is hard. Sometimes you can do it. Sometimes you can't, you know, sometimes you can keep it together when you're with a toddler and sometimes you can't like that's human nature. That being said, I think the question of like, kind of like, oh, what's the point? Like, she's not even going to remember that I, you know, came today to visit her mind will not remember her body. If you come to visit, if you're present, if you're in a relatively regulated nervous system, if you're happy to see her, she's likely, or he's likely going to experience kind of a happiness feeling in their body. They might not remember, you know, an hour later or or a day later, why they're happy, or even if they were happy, but their body got to experience happiness. And for me, that is worth it time and time and time again. So that really was something for the trip. When we were, when we were going on the trip, it goes back to like, I really wanted her to experience 
that feeling that I, that state that I knew she'd experienced in nature before that kind of like calm awe. And I wanted to feel her in that state. And so even though she wouldn't maybe remember why feeling good feelings is worth it all the time. So I did experience that. I wanted my goal with my mom was to give her as much quality of life and as much happiness as possible without prolonging dying from Alzheimer's, which is a very thin tightrope to walk. And what I found worked best for us, mostly her, but for us was to go to the park or the pool or the library or wherever children were so she could watch the kids play. And she loved it. And we would be out in the sunshine and there was always just this tiny little spark and maybe it was in my head I I don't think so but she always just seemed a little bit lighter a little bit more alert when we came back but in September 2019 we had gone to a conference in Denver the plane was delayed getting home so we got home very early in the morning I am a 100% daylight person Uh after 10 o'clock at night don't bother me I'm asleep (laughs) This extended winter we've had in California this year messed with my solar battery, something fierce, but I showed up and I knew in my head, I'm like, I'm just going to bring a nice treat. I brought, it would happen to be my anniversary. I brought my wedding album just to flip through. She had zero clue how, who any of the people were in that book. It was just something to look at because I knew I'm like, I am tired and getting her from point A to point B is challenging and can be stressful yeah. And I'm just, I'm just going to keep it simple, right? Yeah. That's the smart thing to do. And I show up now, this woman did not know that I was her daughter. She, I don't think she yeah. thought I was her best friend. Didn't remember my name, nothing. She looked at me, she goes, Oh, hi, where are we going today? And I was like, excuse me, <laughs> wait, wait a minute. You remember that we go out every week. I'm like, and then I was like slightly panicking thinking, well, maybe we should go to the park. Cause I didn't want to disappoint her. So Yes, I totally agree. Their body completely remembers those emotions. And she remembered me as the fun friend. And, you know, that's that's not a bad thing. But we did yeah. stay, have the treat, look at the wedding album. Yeah, The caregivers looked with us. They laughed at the 80s wedding dress and all that good stuff. So yeah. it ended up being a fun day, even though we didn't leave. Yeah. And we were outside in the courtyard. So we got probably 90 percent of the same benefits without leaving, which worked yeah. really well. So you were going to say there was one other thing that I interrupted. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's two things with that, that, you know, the first is, you know, we, we really, really, really live in a society that, um, has, has fallen for the, I think therefore I am. And part of that's true. You know, that's what makes up a lot of our distinct humanity. There, there is another part of our, our humanity that is like all of the animal kingdom that we belong to, which is, I feel therefore I am, you know? And so, and that could be, you know, emotional feeling and that could be physical sensation feeling, right? So that's, I think, an important part of when you're stepping into the Alzheimer's and dementia landscape is to go, oh, even though this person's thinking is shifting, maybe rapidly, maybe slowly, they're still, they're still there. They're still uniquely human because their feeling and their sensation is still available to them. So how do I engage with them on that level? You know, give them good feelings, give them good sensation. So that that's one thing to say about that. I think going back to what we were talking about earlier, you know, I think it's really, really easy to get caught up in the, in the landscape of gosh, my parent is not going to remember who I am, or my sister is not going to remember who I am. And it's, that's an excruciating thing to confront with our own identities and our own grief and loss landscape to move through a disease where you're watching the person go and you're simultaneously watching them lose you is very discombobulating. And I think a lot of this journey has taught me about like what I'll call deep remembrance, which is, okay, she might not remember, you know, who I am, where we are, the street that we grew up on, et cetera. Um, But can I remember deeply about humanity, how love and loss really shape us and make us and move us through life? And this might be difficult. This might be a long haul endurance event that has a lot of excruciating moments but the deepest part of the remembrance is like allowing the love and the loss within it to let it guide you and shape you. And I think 
Yes, there are absolutely times where I lost my temper with the like, oh my gosh, she's asked me that question 50 times. I can't take it anymore. And and that's that's gonna happen. And there are other times where I have to like really sink into that like just feeling of okay, I'm I'm we're we're both being shaped by this. And just can I allow us to feel as as okay as possible within it, as comfortable within the discomfort as I can be. Which is good. I know you had a, a hard stop, which keeps me from getting too long on this episode, which is a benefit. <laughs> um, we could some of me and my some of the guests I've had, we could talk for way too long, and oh, sometimes we do. <laughs> so it's actually a benefit. Um, do you have advice on, like, if somebody's at the early stages, like you were with your mom when you went on this trip, on how to? maybe stay a little bit more on the emotion and feeling side. I mean, there's so much to deal with, like, you know, legalities. Are we getting the bills paid? Are we going to the doctor? And there's just all of this, I would guess you could say physical caretaking, you know, like babies, you have to make sure they're fed and they're clean and they're sleep and they've slept and all this stuff. It's so it's similar with our loved one. And I think that's so exhausting that I think a lot of caregivers struggle to end up on the emotion, feeling good, being in the moment. Yeah. Yep. So you got, got a piece of advice for people I before I, I can, oh, good. you know, and this, this is, I think this is a really important component, especially not just for people who are caregivers, but for the entire kind of family or community around, around the loved one, which is the, this goes back to a quote actually from the poet Joy Harjo, um, who said, um, grief is a privilege. And so um, what I'll say about that, and I think the translation of that for me is when you are underwater in the logistical, paying the bills, getting them from here to there, organizing meals, trying to get your own fitness in, taking care of, you know, grandkids, um, making sure you remember everybody's birthdays when your attention is focused on how are we going to get them into a care home, all this stuff. You may well, so this is usually the primary caregiver, you may well not have the time or the energy to be actively processing your grief, to be moving through a conscious grieving process at the same time, and that's okay. For the folks who are, you know, sometimes a little bit more removed. So in my, for my example, I was looking at my dad and going, it's completely unrealistic that I expect him to be in the primary caretaker role that he is in and actively grieving and being like my grief coach as a parent. No, that's too much to ask for one human being. Now, I'm a, I'm one step removed. Sometimes I'm there as a caretaker. Sometimes I'm helping out. But I don't live. I wasn't living with my mom 24-7. I wasn't taking, you know, that kind of care. Certainly on the trip I was. But um, and so I have a little and I don't have children myself, you know, so I had a lot more flexibility and freedom and privilege, I would say, going back to Joy Harjo's quote, to be engaged in an active grieving process. So this is going to look very different for everybody. And I think the biggest tip would be just to ask yourself, realistically, like without thinking about this as I am avoiding the grief, realistically, given all of the moving parts of my life, do I have children Do I have other um, relatives who need care and support? Am I an active caretaker? Am I not? What kind of emotional labor goes into my profession and what doesn't? Once I've looked at that realistically, then I've got to ask myself, okay, how much time and space does that leave me for grief? And I think it's important for us to be very realistic about that in regards to not taking on too much. And I think it's also important for us to be very realistic about that in regards to like, pushing us to the edge of our comfort zone of, I really do need to look at this grief at some point. So that would be my main tip. And also just to have an awareness of everybody in your family, like other people are going to go through grieving processes in a wildly different way, depending on what's, what's, what is the capacity of, of their own life and, and for them to look at this and deal with this in a head on way. So that would be my two cents on that. A lot of challenges that come with this disease. Unfortunately, we're still at the, we're still kind of in the wild west stage of the yeah. community Our you know, our society doesn't understand it. There's the fear that want to deal with it. And it's, that's the one thing I feel like we need to change. And that's why I wanted to have this conversation with you, because the more we understand about how each person's journey, 
also affects us, even though I don't know anybody at this point that hasn't had some touch some of impact, yeah. dementia in their life. Maybe it's just a friend they knew. But until we collectively can wrap our, our, our arms around families that are dealing with this disease, it's going to be going to be a tough, tough climb for a while. But I think we're getting there. I think we're getting it's, there, too. Yeah, I think we are, too. It's changed a lot in the, well, I started the podcast at the end of 2017, started working on yeah, it. Yeah. And back then, social media, you didn't share every detail of your loved one's life. Yeah. <laughs> now, you know, now people are much more open about it. So it's. Yeah. yeah I think are, it's beneficial. Yeah. It is. And so with that, I appreciate very much this conversation. We'll show the book one more time for the people who like to watch the YouTube videos. So this is Everything Left to Remember. It's a very good book. I read it in a couple of days mm -hmm. and it'll make you think, which is not, not a bad thing. Yeah. Hopefully you'll gain some insight into your own journey and maybe it'll make it just a little bit better. Yeah, I hope so. Well, thank you so much for having me and taking the time and meandering from grief landscapes to conversations about golden retrievers and deers. I love <laughs> it. I love it. Oh, well, you can't, can't talk to me without talking about dogs. So. <laughs> Great. I appreciate this and I hope you have an excellent week. Yeah, you too, Jennifer. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.